Good evening and welcome to the Pershing Square Value Investing and Philanthropy Challenge. My name is Rishi Renjan. Uh, I've been the professor for Applied Security Analysis uh, 1 and 2 and been extremely fortunate to be involved with this class in the competition for the last eight years. Um, but we all know it's a team effort, so I have a couple of people to thank up front. First, I want to thank our TAs, Jamie Schmidt and Victoria Gu, who uh, did a great job in obviously making this another seamless semester. Um, also, obviously, want to thank the team from the Helburn Center, Meredith, Caroline, Julia, and Jennifer, for obviously their help all throughout the entire semester, but especially in organizing this evening. Um, lastly, we want to recognize the countless mentors and investment firms that participated in this year's class. Um, beyond the learnings of the classroom and obviously the Pershing Square Challenge, the network and relationships that the students have been able to build undoubtedly goes beyond the timeline of this semester. So please join me in a round of applause to the full team that makes this event. Um, before I introduce Bill and the reason we're all here, I do want to say thank you to the students, uh, particularly since this is technically our last class of the semester. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, under Bill's recommendation, uh, for this year only and the first time in 11 years, we made the focus of the class a short only investment. Um, we also limited the number of slides uh, in each presentation that all of the judges have to 40 slides. Um, we found that this provides greater emphasis on depth of research, on quantitative analysis, value-added research, presentation skills, and variant perception, and I think it's uh, definitely made this one of the best years yet. Um, I hope you all learned a little bit from me about investment process and the art of shorting. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. And as a return favor, I promise there'll be no cold calling this evening from at least me. Um, and now a little word about our sponsor. Uh, this is actually the 11th Pershing Square Valley Investing and Philanthropy Challenge. So I think that in and of itself uh, warrants a round of applause. It's an absolutely uh, fantastic event. What has been attempted to be replicated elsewhere um, because of Bill, Columbia Business School is the only institution where Pershing Square has created this challenge. Um, the challenge was born from Bill's idea that we're, while we're training the next generation of value investors, uh, we should also think about a philosophy of applying the same theories of identifying asymmetric rewards to bettering society as well, just as Bill has done throughout his entire career. Uh, we're absolutely honored to have Bill and Pershing Square sponsor this challenge. Um, as we all know, Bill is one of the best uh, value investing and activist track records of, of our generation. He's also an absolutely terrific mentor, advisor, and obviously friend to Columbia Business School and the value investing program. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Bill. So thanks for the, uh, the kind introduction. Um, so this, first of all, I want to thank Rishi because this class succeeds because of uh, its professor, not because of the sponsor. And uh, and as I th not everyone in the audience knows, Rishi is a full-time practitioner in the industry, and he teaches because he, I guess, loves teaching. Um, so uh, I don't know why it makes economic sense for us to subsidize the program to create the next generation of competitors. I haven't figured out that yet. Um, <laughs> but maybe we can learn something. And perhaps if we had uh, done the Pershing Square Challenge on short selling earlier, I might have learned a little bit more about short selling. Um, <laughs> and I hope to learn more uh, uh, this evening. So. Um, we uh, reviewed all of the uh, submissions this year, and uh, the, the quality just continues to increase, and uh, we're, we're very pleased with that. Um, prize money is also compounded at a nice rate. We're up to $150,000. The judges retain the discretion to allocate it all to one, uh, split it among one, two, and three, uh, or to the first and second prize. So we have a lot of discretion as judges. Um, I'm going to ask the judges to introduce themselves. Uh, new, a, a mix of new judges this year, um, and uh, we try to focus on people who actually know something about short selling. So other than me, I, you know, experience is making mistakes and learning from them. I like to say this, so I'm a, the most experienced short seller on the panel based on experience. Uh, please. Uh, Berna. Hi, I'm Victoria Hart. I manage a fund called Pinnacle View Capital. I'm also a Columbia 2002 MBA, so really pleased to be here tonight. Um, I think this is a great value that Bill's doing, so thank you for hosting it and inviting me to be the judge. Um, thank you. Berna's next. Hi, my name's Berna Barche. I'm in the, in the process of launching a new fund called um, Viola Capital um, after being a veteran of several different hedge funds and having run a fund called the Ingleside Select Fund for five years. Um, and I am a consumer specialist and a short seller. 
Hi, I'm Ryan Israel, and I work with Bill at Pershing Square, and I've been there for the last nine years. And so my short selling experience has been through osmosis of Bill and, and our firm's experiences. Mm -hmm. By the way, the, the way the votes work is the Pershing Square representatives in the panel, of which there are three, get, get one-third vote each. So we're, we're, we're a voting block of one. Uh, I'm Anthony Massaro. I uh, have worked at Pershing Square for uh, five years. Uh, I'm Paul Sonkin. Uh, I've been a portfolio manager for, oh, I guess, 25 years. Uh, we just published a book that I'm sure well, I hope most of you have read called Pitch the Perfect Investment, uh, myself and Paul Johnson. Paul's been a, a professor at Columbia for, I guess, about 25 years. I taught as an adjunct for 16 years. And I'm very happy to be invited by uh, Bill to be a judge. Hi, uh, my name is Gillian McIntyre. Um, I am in the process of relaunching my fund 221B uh, with my partner, Fraser Pairing. We are activist short sellers. Um, and uh, my prior experience working with Chris Hahn of the Children's Fund as his short seller. I'm Sam Madrangi. I'm with Carousel Capital. We're short activists. We've been operating for nine years. And uh, you can follow us on our Twitter, uh, Carousel Cap. And uh, thank you very much for Bill for inviting me here. Hi, I'm Whitney Tilson. Uh, sole claim to fame is as uh, buddies with Bill in college. Uh, we've been friends ever since. Uh, Bill sort of inspired me to get into the business uh, 20 years ago, ran a hedge fund for 18 years. Um, occasional short activist, uh, probably best known for uh, being on 60 Minutes, helping bring down lumber liquidators. Excellent. So this should be a lot of fun. 10-minute uh, presentations, 10 minutes for Q&A, uh, and let's get started. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ryan Darone. I am joined here by my teammates Brad and John. Our pitch is short, CH Robinson. Current market price is $94. We have a price target of $70, representing a 26% return. So CH Robinson is the largest freight broker in the world. Basically, what they do is match available freight with available capacity. If you look at this picture up here, this is actually what their business looks like. A lot of people think C.H. Robinson, they think trucks, they think transportation assets. They don't own any transportation assets, they don't own any trucks. When you think about their business, it's more like a legacy travel agency or a stockbroker. So a little bit about the trucking industry. Um, carriers are highly fragmented, it has extremely low barriers to entry. Now, historically, shippers have relied on freight brokers to help them find capacity. That's why C.H. Robinson exists. Also, freight brokers handle about 15% of total shipments in the United States. And historically, brokers' margins have increased in times of relative supply-demand imbalance. So C.H. Robinson, they have three segments. Uh, number one is North America Service Transportation. That's going to be their truck brokerage. That's going to be two-thirds of net revenues and by far the most important segment. And that segment is truckload, less than truckload, and intermodal. Now, our investment thesis focuses on their core operations, which is their NAST segment. With that in mind, our investment thesis is, number one, changing market dynamics will accelerate their margin declines. Number two, CH is over-earning and new tech entrants are coming on the scene. And number three, business fundamentals are deteriorating while competitors are thriving. So how does C.H. Robinson make money? Basically what they do is they take the spread between how much they pay for transportation and the rate they charge the shippers. That spread is called the net revenue margin. And that's historically been between 15 to 20%. Now freight brokers do business on either a spot basis, so immediate shipments. Uh, they also do it on a future capacity basis, so shippers will agree to pay a predetermined price for future capacity. So with that in mind, CH sells truckload capacity on a 35 to 65% basis spot contract mix, but purchase 95% of capacity on the spot market, which is a huge weakness as spot prices increases. Spot prices increase. So our primary research suggests that in 2018, spot price rates increases will set new records at two times the previous price increase records. And John's going to now get into what that means for C.H. Robinson's future and their current business. Okay, so to build on what Ryan just went over, 
Um, as GDP growth stays above 2.5%, the 100% capacity utilization and record-breaking driver shortage will not be able to be reduced. Um, as well, com compounding this issue is the electronic logging device mandate. What this does, it's a new regulation that mandates all uh, driving hours are recorded electronically versus manual logs of, uh, that were previously used. And it's important because it's uh, well known that before this uh, mandate went into effect, uh, that the drivers were not fully reporting all of their time. And on April 1st, when it was enforced, 7% of the capacity within the market was reduced year over year. So in summary, you have increasing supply or increasing demand while supply is reduced, which will push up prices going forward. So the street views uh, these price increases as a positive for CH. However, both of these charts show that they're having a lot of difficulty passing on those price increases. And so the situation is CH is getting squeezed on both sides by the shippers and the carriers. And even though we are projecting margins to decrease, a 15% uh, spread for being an intermediary is still a great profit. So you have other new entrants coming into the industry and trying to capture that profit. Uh, first are the carriers themselves. So they are starting brokerages or brokerages within their own company. And you also have tech, uh, new tech players. Um, and this is also changing the dynamics between the legacy brokers themselves. So they're competing on price. And important to note is outlined in the red box. Um, so over the past two years, CH has lost roughly 10% of their market share to these uh, from the new dynamics. Also, one more thing, 50% of all of CH's orders are fully automated, meaning 50% strictly compete on price. And that's going to be important going forward. So um, keeping in mind that uh, CH has roughly a 15 to 20% spread. Uber's only targeting a 5% spread. Um, so th that means that they are trying to court uh, demand and court the shippers themselves, while Convoy is taking the opposite approach. Convoy is trying to um, appeal to the drivers themselves. And a great quote in terms of the value that they provide to the drivers is at the bottom. Um, importantly as well is Amazon. They are um, attempting to completely elim eliminate the margin by building out vertically themselves. So as CH continues to defend against both of these new types of entrants, the returns are decreasing. Um, even though the ROIC is still high, it's a result of, pre, of uh, allocations from far into the past. The recent um, investments are actually negative, which is shown by the incremental returns. Okay. Looking at the volume, CH is not even uh, keeping up with the market. And when you think about their volume growth and their profits, so in 2017 Q4, they're negative loads. Those are um, purchase agreements that they take on at a, um, at a net negative profit. Those doubled in 2017 Q4. And keeping all that in mind, they still continue to grow headcount. Showing how sensitive they are in terms of operating leverage, if you looked at 2017 results and you reduced the spread by 1%, net income would have been reduced by 13.5%. Um, and going back to Uber, they're only targeting a 5% spread. Meanwhile, um, CH is currently at roughly 16%. 6% difference in terms of decreasing CH's spread would, um, would make net profits uh, negative. And Brad will now, I guess, review the outputs of our research. Yeah, so uh, given this information, we constructed three cases. We also have the corresponding probabilities and expected share price of roughly $70. Our cases were driven prim primarily by two important variables. The first was the revenue growth rate, and the second was the net revenue margin, both of those of the North American trucking, trucking segment alone. Um, we also provided the last three-year actual numbers to give you some context to our assumptions. So in terms of catalysts, um, first, tech players are going to enter this industry and they are going to rapidly gain market share. It's going to be propelled by their achievement of scale. There are already platforms that exist that match shippers and carriers directly and only charge 1% transaction fee. Um, 
Um, so this, uh, the, the brokerage industry is going to be changed forever. Uh, the net revenue margins that traditional brokers like CH have enjoyed are going to go down permanently. At the same time, because brokers are struggling to find capacity, they are uh, the shippers who need reliability are going to go directly to the carriers and uh, to fulfill their shipping needs. So there are some things that CH could do in the near term to counter our thesis. Uh, the first is that they could simply choose to ignore some of the pricing agreements and fulfill orders at the spot, uh, at the spot market, and this would drive up their net revenue margin above what we've projected. <clears throat> Additionally, if CH could convince a tech platform that you know, we have cultivated relationships over the years that could be valuable to your tech company, um, the market could perceive the combined value of those two companies is greater than the sum of the individual parts. With that said, um, yeah, with that said, Barry, appreciate the opportunity to uh, present to all of you today, and we'd be happy to review any of the points in our thesis. So if you have a question from the panel, raise your hand and pass the mic down. Do we need to speak into this? Or? So, um, so one of the risks that you haven't talked about is, is how under-levered it is. So I think it's tracking what one times leverage. So what's to stop the management from essentially doing a massive buyback and you know, leveraging up and buying back stock? Well, they also just recently filed, um, I guess, 600 notes versus long-term debt. And what they're planning to do with that is reduce uh, what's outstanding in their current revolver, so that's 600 million, push that to long term. Um, and then in terms of the borrowing capacity, so you'd have roughly 1350 um, outstanding in terms of long term debt. They still have another 900 they could pull on in short term. Net debt to EBITDA would be around 2.1, 2.2. Uh, this is actually, yeah. I just have one other question. So, with regards to the management team, what historically have they, is there any pattern that you can point to? In, in the prior downturn, um, you know, in terms of the behavior of the management team? In terms of what? In terms of the management team, in terms of their behavior, how they reacted to the downturn, um, sort of what, what they did to change the structure or anything to combat um, the declining stock price. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the street definitely looks at, at See, it Robinson as a defensive stock. Um, so in downturns, generally, uh, it does better. Um, management, they, their capital allocation strategy is basically to buy back shares no matter what, up, up down. Um, so if we want to show that slide, we're, yeah. Uh, I guess just to, just to build on that, um, so the street is more sensitive to the spread versus anything else, and that's why the volume is, is really uh, trailed off, um, just because if that the spread decreases, there'll be more of a reaction in, in stock price. So in terms of managing vo like how they would manage it, they would just decrease their volumes. Um, but they would also have, in terms of keeping their shippers happy, as we said, 2017 Q4, those uh, negative loads doubled. Uh, that tends to be their, their behavior, um, taking on, I guess, contracts at a loss. I just want to give you a chance to answer the first question. I think you were, you were not quite finished. You were talking about the incremental debt capacity. And as we've learned, you can be entirely right on the fundamentals, but if the share count shrinks dramatically when you're short, you can lose a lot of money. Right, so they are, in terms of just their purchasing, um, their buyback program, it's just 90% of net income. Um, they've done a special buyback once before, and if you look at this slide, 30, roughly 35% of all um, EPS growth has been through buybacks. So um, if they were, though, to if they were to increase their leverage, they would probably lose their investment grade rating because they're at a triple B minus roughly right now. Um, and that's before issuing the new debt and then also um, before p adding uh, new debt to their revolver as well. So they're at 1.3 times net debt to EBITDA right now. Management said they're comfortable going up to three times. Um, we don't think that's very likely to happen, but we could definitely see them going up to 2.5 or so. Also, they're so operationally levered, it'd be, um, it, it would be very difficult to sell that, I think, to the street. Well, one of your main points is the market share loss and you expect more erosion. Um, so how, does, how do they defend it and how important are some factors that might be unique to them? Because you mentioned price, but then you didn't mention quality and timing and assurance of delivery and other things that customers might value, as well as the ability to bundle small packages, so the alpha. 
<clears throat> less than a uh, truckload and how, you know, the more difficulty so, of doing that. Right, so this is primarily a commoditized business. Less than truckload really isn't that much of their overall portfolio. We can go back to that. Um, but yeah, just in, in terms of what it, um, what truckload is and their connection. So CH has said that their competitive advantage is uh, relationships on the local level with shippers and carriers, but their centralized system uh, or their t new technology system is so centralized where the um, value that they have from uh, having people at the local level isn't able to be used. And that was shown through the mass exodus in terms of the advanced uh, leadership or the, the uh, sales leadership team. They, uh, they left roughly three to five years ago. And now when you call CH, you get somebody who's 22, 23, right out of college, and it's pretty much just data input. Um, so there's not really any differentiation. Um, and going forward, we'll see that. And there's no contracts in place that creates more stickiness or anything that, as I said, defends their market share? They're, yeah, there's, so that 50%, they're just competing on price? Yes. Yeah. So, Always up for ahead. No. Yeah, so 70% uh, of their business now is, is um, automated or, or booked through, through the use of their, um, their computer portal. And you can see they've lost tremendous market share. Um, so they're, they're trying to enter into the tech space, but they're, they're losing market share. And they're kind of getting squeezed into the middle. I think you have like these tech players um, that are coming at them from one direction and stealing market share. And then you have the entrance of, um, of either carriers that are, getting, that are getting brokerage divisions or just smaller brokerage divisions that are better able to kind of handle the people-to-people -people relationships. Um, and they're getting really stuck in the middle. One more thing to note is it's never been a better time to be a trucker or a truck driver right now. Um, they can basically command almost any salary that they want. Like there's, I don't know if you guys seen the advertisements, but you can almost make six figures right now, uh, or well into them right now. So it's really uh, the negotiating power that they have is gone, um, just because of, there's so many other options. And I think that quote from Convoy really explains that. And um, because it was pretty much known, or the, the drivers actually do not like the dealing with CH Robinson, they would much rather prefer an app. Um, and knowing Looking at the schedule that Convoy gives them, they can see that they're, uh, they're out there, and then also their backhaul. So, I mean, the overall thesis sounds compelling. What doesn't sound that compelling is, is in a sense, your price target. So why is this such, you know, why only 26% in light of all these business, fund, you know, margin compression, technological entrance, existing valuation, you know, why is this not a better short than you've described? Yeah. Yes, I mean, that's definitely our base case is $70. Um, but we definitely foresee scenarios in which it, it gets a lot worse. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's the timing of Uber and all these new tech entrants gaining scale. Once they get to the tipping point, it's kind of hard to tell exactly when that's going to happen. Um, right now, they actually have 1% of overall freight market share. And, yeah, like Uber Freight and Convoy and Transfix, those three combined have about 1%. Um, but that's happened in the span of a couple of years, a few years. And Uber Freight, for example, they just, they just branched from Texas, branched out from Texas. Like they were just only in Texas. And now that they've branched out to the rest of the United States, we could see that, that affecting CH. How much market, market share do they have in Texas, Uber Freight? Uh, we don't know the answer to that. We don't know exactly how much market share they had in Texas. Um, but so UBS thinks they're doing about 200 mil in revenues right now. Uber Freight is, so. They're doing fairly well. What has the company's acquisition history been, and um, what is their overall market share? And because it looks like there's a lot of smaller players here, and could they? It seems like this would be, an, uh, you know, something that you could roll up. Is there the potential for creative acquisitions that could derail your short in the in the short term? Well, I, I guess first off, um, in terms of the acquisition. We've spoken to actually a lot of the brokers and carriers and, um, and uh, I guess shippers themselves in terms of our primary research. The feedback has been if CH would acquire somebody like Echo, they would just reduce the overall revenues given to the combined company, right? So they're fully saturated uh, CH pretty much within America. Um, and with that in mind, that's why CH is expanding to other uh, geographies. So that's Europe and Australia, which have naturally a lower margin. So CH knows that they're that they can't really get any bigger no matter what they do in the US. And I'll let you so take the other On your point on the acquisition history, um, they started doing acquisitions in, in 2012. Um, and mostly in global forwarding and their other segments, so not truckload. Uh, Freightquote.com was a huge acquisition for them a few years ago. That was for, to branch out into LTL. 
Um, but if, if you can see the incremental ROICs out here, um, they started doing acquisitions in 2012, and since then their incremental ROICs have not done so well. And ROICs are down. So I think from that standpoint, uh, they've not been very creative to yeah. net income. And just one thing to note, um, the truck the truckload and less, less than truckload brokerage in the U.S., roughly a 6% operating margin. Uh, global forwarding, roughly 4%. So any time that they expand global forwarding, naturally, you know, it's less valuable. Uh, I was wondering, a lot of the statistics that you bring up, it's a very compelling investment case. Um, how can I be confident that it's not priced into the stock already? Because I would think that an analyst that's following the company you know, n would know their mix between, uh, you know, spot and contract, and they know that the driver, uh, uh, you know, the shortage of drivers, and they know that there's new technology coming into the market. So uh, is it priced into the stock already? Uh, I would say um, there's both sides are priced in. Uh, I think that is, yes. What they are betting on is they're betting on CH's ability to renegotiate the contracts. Um, so how it works is not really contracts, they're purchase agreements. And after roughly 180 days, they can reprice, but just a little bit. In order for the bull case to be correct, CH would have to renegotiate um, on a percentage basis that's never been done before. Um, and just with spot market rising so quickly, when they have, when 60% of their contracts actually reprice in the first half of the year, um, as that spot rate continues to, uh, to, to climb, you know, those contracts are going to be worth less and less. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Winter Lee. I'm joined by Tyler Redd and Steve Tao. Today, we're pitching a short on Credit Acceptance Corp, ticker CACC, with a $212 price target or a 33% downside. Credit acceptance is a $6 billion market cap subprime uh, used car lender based in the US. The company uh, works with used car dealerships and finances customers at the very low end of the credit spectrum under the purchase program and the portfolio program. Under the purchase program, the company purchases the loan from used car dealerships and takes on the full risk and reward. On the other hand, for the portfolio program, the company makes a smaller upfront payment called an advance and, any and, and the remainder is in a profit sharing arrangement called a dealer holdback. Only when the advance is fully collected by CACC is any incremental collections going into the uh, dealer holdback and that's shared between CACC and the car dealerships at a 20-80 split. The important takeaway here for the portfolio program is that the risk and reward is shared and number two, the incentives are aligned between CACC and the dealerships. Um, the portfolio program has not been replicated by peers, and it's one of the reasons why the company has had such a strong performance over the past few years. The cur company currently trades at four times book or 12 times earnings compared to peers at one time book or 10 times earnings. The bulls would argue that uh, the portfolio program is differentiated and should con continue to help the company earn high returns. In addition to that, um, it should trade at a premium. They would also say that the recent deterioration in fundamentals is only cyclical, and once the cycle turns, a lot of the smaller players are going to get out of the industry. CACC should be able to, to take share. Also, they argue there's still a long runway for growth. We disagree, and our presentation will address each of these issues. Our thesis is predicated on, number one, the industry uh, is showing um, Number one, the industry uh, fundamentals is, is showing signs of deterioration. Number two, CACC's competitive advantage is uh, eroding and the dealer economics is declining. And number three, we think CACC is worse positioned this time than any other cycles in the past. The company already took a large provision for credit losses in Q4 and we think that's only the first shoe to drop. Expanding on each of these, starting with industry fundamentals, the top chart shows that the delinquency rates for non-banks is close to all-time highs. Meanwhile, unemployment rate is near all-time lows. In addition to that, some of the industry tailwinds is turning into headwinds. Used car prices has been a tailwind over the past few years, but we've seen that turn negative uh, in recent months. Keep in mind that uh, used car volumes is already a negative. In addition to that, CACC is charging at the top end of the state usury rate, 
and any in increases in Fed funds rate is going to be a headwind to returns and earnings. So the key to the uh, portfolio program is getting a used car dealer to make a better loan. Uh, credit acceptance has been able to accomplish this historically in the past by uh, making those back-end profit sharing payments as loans perform well. However, we see to the left, the average dealer is now receiving a check that's 50% lower than just five years before. And we see to the right, that same dealer is now taking twice as long to hit that 100 loan minimum requirement. So for the rest of this presentation, we're going to show you that credit acceptance has been making both the largest and the longest loans in the company's history. And we want you to ask yourselves one important question. What incentives have dealers had recently to make good loans? So bulls are going to tell you everything we show you showing uh, declining fundamentals that credit acceptance is simply a function of industry cyclicality. Uh, they're going to point at the chart to the top. Credit acceptance producing a ROIC of 11% in 2017. That looks pretty comparable to 2007. Uh, we agree with uh, uh, Bulls. We're going to talk a lot about 2007. We agree with Bulls. We think that's a pretty comparable time in the industry cycle to uh, where we are today. However, we think you need to dig deeper. Uh, we would point you at the chart at the bottom. Uh, credit acceptance has gained considerable operational scale over the last decade to the point where an 11% ROIC today on a consolidated basis actually means loan IRRs are probably around 15%. That compares to 21% in 2007. It's down 30%. Uh, we think this is a clear sign there are secular issues at play. Uh, so we've had the chance to talk to a lot of credit acceptance's largest investors. Uh, most of them are actually uh, hoping for the cycle to turn. They think credit acceptance is going to emerge stronger and it's going to take market share, a lot like what happened in 2009. Um, we have some doubts that this pattern is going to repeat itself to the same degree. Uh, we're happy to take that a little bit more in Q&A. So we're now in the seventh year of this industry cycle, and uh, the unprecedented intensity and depth of competition is forcing credit acceptance to take some pretty aggressive actions in order to maintain growth. Uh, number one, to the far right, we show you that loan uh, units uh, were actually down in 2017, uh, especially for that portfolio program. Uh, credit acceptance got around this by making its loans larger. Voila, loan growth. Uh, to the left, we see capital is flowing into the purchase program. And again, the purchase program is where credit acceptance takes 100% risk. It's undifferentiated. It's exactly what its uh, struggling competitors do. And to the right, we see that now as the purchase program is at record levels, these loans are increasingly not performing. So again, bulls think 2007 is pretty comparable to where we are in the industry cycle today. However, we think credit acceptance's book is much worse this time around. Uh, number one, we point you to show that uh, average loans are 45% larger, they're 35% longer, they're skewed to the purchase program, and credit acceptance has much less reserves this time. Uh, number two, credit acceptance's uh, margin of safety at the individual loan level is the difference between what it forecasts in collections and how much it actually gives and advances to its dealers. This is at record lows, especially in that purchase program. Uh, to the bottom left, uh, bulls are going to tell you the stock won't decline as much as it did during the last cycle when the cycle turns. Uh, we would show them to the chart to the right. Stock was down 20% a few months ago on a black box fourth quarter provision. We're going to talk a lot more about that provision, but we love the way the stock reacted there. Uh, we think it illustrates the potential to get paid on this as deterioration increasingly falls to the bottom line. On slide 11, we show that credit acceptance is under provision compared to peers despite underwriting converging within the industry. So in the top three charts on this page, you see that credit acceptance loans are becoming larger than peers, have increased by 20 months compared to only 13 months for the next closest peer, and are generating 10 percentage points lower in yield today versus a decade ago. However, delinquencies, provisions, and charge-offs have increased across the industry, and more importantly, the gap between where credit acceptance is provisioning and charging off is far below peers today than a decade ago. So we believe the risk reward for a credit acceptance short is very compelling right now. In January of 2018, as Tyler had mentioned, credit acceptance announced an unexpected increase in provisions, which was two times above street estimates. After this announcement, the stock dropped 20%. We think that just given where credit acceptance is reserving on its loan book, it's far below peers, and there may be further increases in provisions, which will serve as an important catalyst to further declines in the stock price. Credit acceptance also has off-market accounting policies, which makes it difficult for the street to quickly see this. Second, we think management is sending mixed signals to the market. Over the last 18 months, the company has had two longtime insiders leave the company, including the president, Stephen Jones, who announced his resignation two Fridays ago, and also the founder and then chairman, Don Foss, 
who, who left the company in 2017. Since leaving the company, FOSS has sold more than $450 million worth of its shares. Current management is also sending mixed signals to the market. They have decelerated share, share repurchases and have not repurchased stock above $220, $220, which is 30% below where the stock is trading today. While we believe that there is significant downside to the stock, we also believe the upside is quite limited. In the charts on the top, you'll see that ROIC has declined from 12.5% to 10.5% in a rising interest rate environment, which means their net interest margins are being squeezed and their ability to grow economic profit is becoming tougher. In Q4, the company actually reported negative growth in economic profit, which was the first time since before the financial crisis. So now we have the opportunity to shore credit acceptance at its historical three-year average valuation, but with a much lower short interest and a much lower cost to borrow, in addition to the deteriorating fundamentals that we've spoken about today. Based on our underwriting, we're projecting EPS to decline by 13% over the next three years to $21 per share, or 30% below consensus forecasts. <coughs> our, our forecast is driven by three main variables. One is flat growth in loan originations, two is a declining yield, and three is an, incre an increase in provisions. We think the first two variables is driven by today's increasingly competitive environment, and an increase in provisions will be driven by an under-reserved loan book. Based on our EPS forecast, and assuming a 10 times PE multiple, we think there's 33% downside to the stock price today. In our bow and bear cases, we underwrite a different scenarios in loan book growth, but our price target in those scenarios are really driven by different levels of provisioning and different valuation scenarios. You'll see that in our bear case, we believe there's 72% downside in the stock compared to only 30% upside in our bow case. This concludes our presentation, and we would now like to turn it over for Q&A. I'm curious why you chose this company to short and to present. Sure, maybe I can take a stab at that. So when we first uh, were picking stocks, we wanted to find a stock with a lot of tension and um, where we could do a deep dive and have a lot of value add. Uh, credit acceptance ch checked all of those boxes. Once we dove a little bit deeper, we found that credit acceptance also uh, showed uh, provision for credit losses in Q4, so we, and we saw some industry st stats that made us question it a little bit more, and we were able to do some primary research on it as well, so that's how we came to the name. And how do you think about timing? You know, timing, obviously, a key consideration for any shorts. This has been a very rapidly growing company with high earnings growth, higher returns on capital, obviously some interesting uh, negatives, but why now? Sure. Yeah, so we think that this has been quite a popular short over the last two to three years, and a lot of the heads, headwinds that the company is facing um, two or three years ago, they're still facing today. But the, we will point at three main differences in 2018 versus 2017. One is you do not, credit acceptance does not have the benefit of increasing car prices, which will allow them to grow their loan book. So if you look at the Mannheim index or other indicators, used car pricing is actually turning, which will now be a headwind to credit acceptance and its ability to grow loan book. Two, we believe that in January of 2018, this was the first time when they announced um, provisions much above street levels. And I think a year ago, the question was, is credit acceptance actually able to um, remain under, under reserved and under provision compared to peers, but this is the first drop in the water, and we think that the book remains under provisioned and under reserved, and there will be further increases in provisions. Finally, you have um, a combination of former, manage, former management selling significantly their stock, and you have current management not um, historically buying back many shares, actually decreasing their share count by 50% over the last decade, but they have effectively paused their share repurchases and have not purchased above the 220 price level. Thank you. Could you talk a little bit about the competitive environment? You mentioned that it's her third dealer portfolio program. How much of that's due to the lower interest rate environment, which is causing subprime lenders to go in and compete with them on price, and if interest rates reverse, would inure to the, the benefit of credit acceptance? Sure. So what was the question? Um, Sure, I can, I can take a stab at this. Um, so there, there's been a lot of co uh, competition coming in, especially with PE funded. As you can see from the bottom right chart, um, a lot of them came in 2014, 15, and 16. Um, so, so we've seen a lot of competition uh, in there. In addition to that, underwriting standards have come down as well. 
um, just from our primary research uh, talking to dealers. A lot of them actually proactively, so this is not just one, but several dealers proactively told us ways where we can tr try to get financing. So I, when we said we have no income or, or, and we have no FICO score, they told us that you can uh, just transfer into your bank account on a, month, on a weekly basis the same amount, even if you take it out the next day, it, it, show, it, it can be passed as income. So they don't even need a pay stub anymore as before. So we can see that the under, uh, underwriting standards have, have worsened. Uh, they've also confirmed delinquencies are up and also all of this is driven by increased competition. One of the questions I had is, um, you, know, you touched upon it, but I was wondering if you could just flesh it out. Um, are there specific trends in the auto industry in terms of used car sales um, that is acting as a macro catalyst in your mind for uh, when some of those pro some of, uh, some of that provisioning may occur? Um, or yeah, actually, uh, something in the new car more. industry is actually interesting for what we think is going to happen in used car pricing. Uh, we saw high SARS for new cars in 2012, 2013, 2014. Uh, usually about 50 or 60 percent of those were leased. Those are coming off lease pretty soon, so we think that's going to have a big impact on new car, used car pricing going forward. And uh, I think last year was actually peaked uh, used car sales, and we saw that decline a little bit, and uh, pricing moved up, but now we don't have pricing uh, working in our favor as well. Got it. So in your thesis, you're expecting, you know, higher provisions going forward, even if the economy continues to be as strong as it, as it is. Um, and that's sort of uh, indicated by what you're seeing from some of their peers. Yeah, that's right. And what we did was we also looked at some of the loans made by Vintage so specifically looking at the securitizations. And if you look at the loans made in 2017 versus 16, what we initially heard was uh, the underwriting kind of tightened up and it got better. But if you look at the size of the advances, the terms, um, the yields are earning, we actually think the loans that credit acceptance is making, it's actually uh, becoming worse. And credit, ex so, so we think that this trend has continued to increase and to some of the points Winter mentioned when we spoke to dealers, it's, it's really easy to get, to get a loan on this. So we think, you know, as the, um, we think there will be further provisions just given where they're reserved compared to some of the peers today. You mentioned loan size going up as the pricing went up. Has there been changes on loan to value on the cars? I don't know if that was in the appendix and I just didn't see it, but in terms of LTV, I know that on the, um, on, in the, on new cars in prime, we've seen rises in LTV um, activity. Has that, has that impacted the used car market at all? You know, we tried to get information on that, talking to dealers to how they're kind of positioning their cars over time. And we do know that credit acceptance to make the portfolio program work, uh, dealers are usually marking the cars up 50 or 60 percent. So most of the loan to values recently have been about 135 or 140 percent. It's just tough to see how that's kind of trended over time. Um, I actually have two questions. And you're right, this has been sort of a consensus short <clears throat> over the last couple of years. And I know a lot of people who've covered, <laughs> covered their stock. Um, the, 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 the two questions I have, one is um, I was surprised you didn't bring up the SEC um, correspondence because there has actually been quite a lot over the last couple of years um, specific to the floating rate adjustment and how that sort of accelerated their revenue recognition. Um, do you think that uh, their dialogue with the SEC is only going to get you know, worse, um, and will it lead to some sort of formal investigation? Because I think we're all sort of waiting for some kind of headline um, here. And then the second thing is, I think there was a event in the Senate today um, with regard to, uh, regards to the CFPB uh, uh, guidelines. Um, so you might want to talk to that, because I, th I thought that that would be against uh, the short in this regard. Yeah, uh, I'll try to answer the first regard. Uh, so yeah, the accounting has been, uh, they had to fire their auditor in 2006 to put in a new kind of form of accounting uh, using pretty much what acquire like uh, bad uh, loans. They, they immediately do use level yield accounting to kind of book income right away when you don't know if it's going to be profitable until the second or third year. Uh, I've seen correspondence with the SEC on that and it's just tough to figure out if that's going to intensify going forward. But there is one interesting accounting uh, I think it's going to go into effect. Uh, Cecil, uh, current expected credit losses should go in, into effect in 2019. Um, these guys should be using exactly what 
CECL is calling for, forecasting losses at origination. Uh, but they're disclosing their 10K and their Qs that they think there's going to be a material impact on their financials. And if they had to start kind of dis uh, booking income as a, a normal kind of loan originator, loan servicer would, we think there's probably 20 or 30 percent downside to EPS. And CISA would go into effect probably 2019. And management's been really reticent on what exactly the effects of that. We tried to ask them that. Sell side has tried to ask them that. They just say it's going to be material. So what is Wall Street missing? Like you have a possible SEC investigation, you know, you, you, you have insiders selling shares. Like, why, you know, why, why isn't the stock down more? Well, and the stock was down 20% 20, 20 on that. So what, what is the street missing? Yeah, so I think when we compare some of our underwrite, underwriting estimates compared to street consensus, the street believes that credit acceptance can continue to grow its loan book. But when you break out the loan book, um, credit acceptance has had, so on a unit basis actually, they had minus 1% unit growth on their loan book last year. But in 2017, they had the benefit of rising car prices, so rising size of loans to offset that. But that's no longer going to be a tailwind. It's going to be a headwind going into 2018. At the same time, they're, being, they're forecasting to collect lower amounts. So, they can, so just given the riskier environment, credit acceptance can only advance a lower amount. So on a net-net basis, we're actually projecting flat growth in new loan originations, whereas Wall Street is still forecasting um, a pretty robust 8, 9, 10% actually. Um, so I think that's one area where we're quite different. And the second is just on, on the provisioning. Um, we think in January that was a first sign that they're under-reserved. Again, if you look at where they're um, reserved compared to Santander or some of the other comps, they're just much, they're, they're far below. I think 8% on reserves versus 13, 14% for Santander. Just to follow up on that, I mean, I think a lot of people got burned, especially at the beginning of 2017 when short interest was so high. Uh, ended up having uh, to cover in 2017 as the company kind of bought back stock. We just think they were a little too early with some of the actions that we, we've kind of highlighted with why now. We think now is the appropriate time, especially on a risk reward basis when the company can't grow in its book to kind of limit the upside in the stock. So you're saying that people realize it, but they can't put the short position on. Like during the financial crisis, everybody knew that stocks were cheap, but they couldn't buy because they were worried about redemptions. Is that, is that what you're saying? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think it was just that a lot of people were early before on, on the short. Um, it's a good question. I think we we're, we're I think uh, one, of the, one of the keys we just want to focus on is also the risk and reward. I think just on Steve's first point on, in terms of growth, um, you, you have to believe there's still going to be a lot of loan originations going forward. And in our analysis, we don't think that's going to happen. If we just look at this slide in terms of uh, market penetration that we estimated. So if you look at the bottom right chart, if we focus on the blue bar to the right, right now they have 11,500 active dealers. And what we've seen is that they've turned through 15,000. So if we add them together, they've actually penetrated over 26,000, and that's over 45% of the uh, total addressable market. So um, we think going forward, lo loan growth is going to be a lot slower. So that, that also uh, decreases some of our upside as well. Um, and right now, they're churning through, just on this slide, um, the, the red bar over there, 3,012. Um, that, that's how many, uh, how many uh, dealers they're turning through every year. So that's 5% 5 5 of the total uh, used car dealerships in the US. So they have to replace that just to stay flat. So compared to if you're referring to the last financial crisis when they were only turning through 580 or 1% of the used car dealerships, we think right now they've had to make up a lot more just to catch up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening. My name's Arthur Brousseau. With me tonight are my teammates, Greg Dozier de Speville and Yetling McGrath. We're pitching short Harvey Norman Holdings, ticker HVN. Stock trades on the Australian Stock Exchange at a price of AUD $3.38. That's about seven times EBITDA, nine and a half times earnings. The company has a market cap of 2.9 billion USD. Our two-year price target has a our two-year outlook has a price target of AUD $2.19 translates into a 35% return. So what is Harvey Norman? Harvey Norman is an Australian-based big box retailer of electronics and furniture. 
Uh, you can think of it as like a hybrid between a Best Buy and a Bed Bath & Beyond. And there's two kind of main pieces to the business. There's the international retail operation, which we're not really focusing on tonight. And then there's the core Australian retail business, which is our focus. Now, the interesting aspect of this retail business in Australia is that it's operated solely by franchisees. Um, you know, that's not really something we generally see in the retail space. So the franchisees run the stores, and they pay Harvey Norman a fee to do so, about 14 to 15% of revenues. And this business makes up about 53% of the company's EBITDA. So looking to the bottom right, you'll see there's 195 locations across Australia. And this is operated by a network of 684 franchisees. So you do have multiple franchisees operating within a single physical location. One may be running the electronics business, the other's running the furniture business, and so forth. We would like to point out that 95 of these locations are housed on Harvey Norman-owned real estate. And this is a big chunk of the company's value that's tied up in invest, uh, investment properties. So our main argument tonight is that Harvey Norman is a fragile business likely at the top of the cycle, facing both structural and cyclical headwinds. And it's managed by a team that lacks accountability and often avoids transparency. Specifically, our thesis is threefold. First, the, franchise, the, franchise, uh, the revenues from franchise fees are unsustainable. This puts pressure on many of the franchisees and creates an, a very fragile network. Further, many of the working capital loans that have been lent out to these franchisees are likely no longer recoverable. Second, through some proprietary analysis, we've identified numerous locations that need to be shut down, and shutting these locations down will impair the value of the real estate. And third, we think intense competition and a slowdown in both the housing and consumer credit markets could be the last straw for this fragile network. We think our views divergent from the market given this proprietary analysis and data we've looked at to not only analyze the underlying health of the franchisee network, but also identify an unusually high churn rate among franchisees. And this has led us to question the sustainability of this franchise model. So quickly, we just wanted to give you an overview of this franchise model and highlight that it really, doesn't really operate like the ones you're used to. In fact, these franchisees are hardly franchisees at all. They're, they're much more like employees. So they put zero startup capital into these things. Uh, they can only sign 30-day leases. Harvey Norman pays them a salary. Harvey Norman controls their inventory and their bank accounts. We, we don't think you're an independent owner of your own business if you can't even control the bank account. But Harvey Norman has this legal structure in place that ultimately allows them to not consolidate the franchise level financials. And without consolidation, it's virtually impossible to get a view down into the franchise level economics. So we wondered what is Harvey Norman trying to mask? Based on our discussions with current and former franchisees and our analysis on comparable companies, we do believe on average these franchisees are loss making or barely breaking even. But we needed to go further. And we gained some proprietary data that proves in fact that these franchisees are failing at an excessive rate every single year. Not only do 100 franchisees fail every year, that's about 15% of their base, but 250 franchisees, which is about 40% of their base, failed in a 2011 sales downturn. It just highlights that this network is extremely fragile. Also, looking at the bottom, we notice that these franchises are failing in a concentrated locations. Um, if these were for uneconomic reasons, it would be distributed across all these locations. So is there any evidence on Harvey Norman's uh, financials that these franchises are struggling? Well, in fact, yes. If you look at the right top, starting in 2010, we see a significant divergence between the franchisee revenues and franchisee cash receipts. This cumulative difference has reached about a billion Aussie dollars in 2017. Now we know already 600 million of this has been expensed as tactical support. However, the remaining is still unexpensed. Due to poor disclosure and changes in accounting policy, it becomes virtually impossible to track this, the evolution of this receivable on the balance sheet. This is probably by design. Now the question remains, how is Harvey Norman able to keep the receivable current and not write it off? Surely auditors have picked this up already. Based on our discussions with industry insiders and ex-franchisees, we believe that Harvey Norman is required to keep on liquidating and reopening franchisees in these uneconom uneconomical locations where they failed in the first place. In an elaborate shuffle, we believe all debt is just being rolled into new franchisees each time. Now, touching to a point I raised earlier, we noticed that these franchisee failures are located in a concentrated number of stores. On top of this, we noticed that this is located in Harvey Norman-owned real estate. 
Harvey Norman should be closing down these uneconomic stores, which will impair Harvey Norman's value through a loss of rent and franchise fees. So now turning to the macroeconomic environment. We know that Harvey Norman has benefited from a booming housing market and a loose consumer credit environment. Harvey Norman has a partnership with a firm called Latitude Financial to offer interest-free financing to their customers. If you look to the chart on the top right, you will note that there's a significant correlation between that the growth in Latitude's loan book and Harvey Norman's franchise network sales. When I lived in Australia three years ago, Harvey Norman was offering six to 12 months interest-free loans to their customers. Nowadays, they have to offer up to 60 months interest-free loans to stimulate sales. Now turning to the catalyst, we see two hard catalysts and two soft catalysts for our thesis to play out. First, a parliamentary inquiry into a scandal-ridden franchise industry scheduled for September 2018. Second, the threat of Amazon is now very real, and we've seen this movie play out before. Third, a, fra a deteriorating macroeconomic environment could put significant strain on an already fragile franchise network. And finally, pressure from <coughs> regulators and proxy advisors <laughs> could lead to increase in disclosure. Now turning to the, to the projections for the business. In our base case, we assume that Harvey Norman will have to close down 25 unprofitable stores, leading to a decline in franchise revenue and rental income. Furthermore, we think that Harvey Norman will have to step up the tactical support to the remaining franchisee base to make them more resilient in the face of increased competition. In sum, we forecast 2019 EBITDA of 462 million which is around 29% below consensus. Applying a seven times multiple to our 2019 EBITDA forecast and impairing $141 million of receivables from franchisees, we arrive at a target share price of $2.19, implying a 35% return. Looking at the possible range of outcomes, in a bare scenario, we overlay a deteriora deteriorating macroeconomic environment to arrive at a share price of $1.20 and a return of 65%. In the bull case, we assume that our thesis is completely wrong and the stock trades up to $5.26, leading to a 56% return. Now, all these issues we've discussed tonight are compounded by a minefield of corporate governance red flags. The chairman, Jerry Harvey, has proven to be hostile to critics of the company. His wife is the CEO, his son sits on the board, and there are only two independent directors who both have board tenure of over 15 years. From making loans to Jerry Harvey's thoroughbred auction house to investing in mining accommodation and dairy farms, this management has cons com consistently plowed capital into non-core investments only to subsequently write them off. So now on to risks. We, we do see a strong valuation ceiling given some of the macro environment uh, factors we've talked about earlier as well as the threat of Amazon. But we have identified five potential risks to our thesis. The first is the churn among the franchisee base is due to some economic reason other than rolling debt. The second, Amazon fails to establish a foothold in Australia. Third, these, this favorable macro environment goes on for way longer than we can anticipate. Fourth, Harvey Norman quite frankly just grows themselves out of the problem, whether that's through their international operations or through a cohort of exceptionally strong franchisees. And lastly, the high dividend yield eats away at the return and limits the life of the trade. These risks aside, however, we'd like to reiterate our strong conviction that this is an extremely fragile business facing both structural and cyclical challenges, and it's led by a management team that's often held unaccountable. Thanks. So how long has this company been in existence? Since 1987. So it's been out, has it been operating the same way over the same period? Yes, it has. So so today it's trading at a nine and a half times PE multiple, almost an 8% dividend yield. It doesn't sound like a particularly high valuation. It sounds like, and again, I don't know enough about the Australian market to know, you know um, where it trades. I guess the question is, what's changed today? Um, I, mean, if they're, I mean, effectively, you're describing something tantamount to fraudulent activity with respect to how they franchise. Am I misunderstanding your point of view? But, or is it, it sounds pretty sketchy the way they manage their franchisee operation. Um, I would not. I mean, we don't have a smoking gun, so we can't definitely say it's fraud. But um, yeah, I mean, the evidence tend to point to the fact that the franchise network is very fragile, and they have to um, and they have to roll over these franchisees, um, especially in those locations which we've identified. So, but then um, how how do they sustain themselves over this long period of time? 
what are the free cash flow characteristics of the business? I mean, they are, they're paying, how are they paying this dividend? Maybe take us through what the balance sheets look yeah, like sure. over time. Uh, no, the free cash flow, yeah. Yeah, so the free cash flow conversion is actually very poor. Um, They've had to borrow more. They have to. They've had to borrow to finance their dividend, and we foresee. I think that's why the yield is so high as well. We foresee that the dividend is going to get cut uh, quite significantly in the coming, in the coming months and years. Um, yeah, and and basically, what, the free ca the EBITDA is really high, but they've been reinvesting in in the money into into investment properties, and um, and re putting money into non-core investments as we highlighted during the thesis, which leads to poor ca free cash flow conversion. Um, also, I mean, you've got to understand that the chairman, Jerry Harvey, he thinks that his business model is sustainable despite the shifting and retail environment. Um, and he's plowing more money into building bigger stores when, you know, you've got Amazon that just launched in Australia and other, if you listen to other CEOs in the retail space in Australia, they, they see the threat of Amazon coming and they're already starting to prepare for it and, and, and change their business model to become more resilient. Jerry Harvey sees it differently. He, he thinks, he says Amazon's a trap, you know, that, that Thinking that Amazon is, is a threat is a trap. And so he just pl keeps on plowing money back into investment properties and, and throwing good money after bad. In terms of where the real estate is located, uh, what are the alternative uses if they were to, you know, this model fails? I mean, how valuable is the underlying real estate? I don't know. Maybe I'll take a shot at that. Um, so these are massive stores, 7,500 square feet on average. They've got even bigger stores. And also to understand the 100 square feet? 75,000 square feet. Okay. Um, and also they're in locations that are not necessarily malls. These are destination shopping. So it's, there would be all home building and different variety of, of stores um, in these complexes. So trying to get a tenant that would be able to fill that space is really limited in, in sort of the options that you can put in there. So although there's definitely still value in the real estate, we do think there's uh, impairment to the value of the real estate. And last quick question. The dividend payment looks a bit strange on the cash flow statement, you know, in terms of its volatility. Do they, what is their dividend policy? Right, you know, 112 million, 334 million, 261, 345, 289. Why is that? It, yeah, I mean, that's really, I mean, there's no dividend policy stated to the market. It's really up to Jerry Harvey. I mean, he, cut the, he already cut the dividend six, mo six months ago. And his reasoning was um, he thought that he wanted to leave some more money into the business to reinvest rather than pay it all out. And he cut the dividend um, in, in, after he released the results for FY17. So, I mean, there's no real guidance from management as to how, how they manage this business and how they manage the cash that's generated by this business. Okay. Other questions? Could you, um, could you go back to that bridge that you had? Because I saw, um, you know, unless I was re uh, reading it wrong, the forecast relative to consensus was pretty divergent. So I'm just a little bit curious if you could just uh, go through that bridge a little bit more and, and understand, if I could just understand, you know, uh, where those, uh, sure. those, you know, each of those items are coming from. So the base case assumes that we close down 25 stores, um, which, will, which results in a decrease in franchise fees um, rent and rental income. Also, we assume that we know that, like currently, the, the Harvey Norman is collecting 14% of the revenues generated by these franchisees in franchise fees. We think this number is too high, um, and it's putting pressure on these franchisees. So we've so, and they, Harvey, Harvey Norman also pays something called tactical support to its fr franchisees. It's basically equivalent to them writing off um, the receivables that they, they have from the, with these franchisees. So we assume that they, given the, the, the tough competition landscape, we think that they're going to have to step up that tactical support to make those franchisees more resilient. Um, and I'm sorry, what's the, tactical support again? So maybe if I can take a shot. So the fees in franchise fees and rent that's due from the franchisees to Harvey Norman that they cannot pay, they would expense that. There's a receivable that they need to collect and they just expense like a, a write-off of receivable. Got it. And that operating deleveraging? Uh, so part, we assume, uh, but you, um, when, what, you, if you look at the, at the past few years, you would, have, you, see, you would see that the franchise fee revenue has been increasing, and there's been quite a lot of operating leverage. So we think that if you shut down the stores, there'll be, oper there'll be some deleverage. So a big part of, your, of this bridge is just you estimate that more stores are going to close this year than what the analysts are? Yes. So, we, so basically, it comes down to the fact that we've identified these 25 stores that we think are uneconomical and that needs to be shut down. So this reflects what... Uh, shutting down those 25 stores 
how it, how the business would shrink if we start shut down those 25 And stores. have you seen that similar pace of store closures in, in prior years, or it's just this year suddenly um, you're seeing you know a wave of store closures that no one's expecting? No, I think, so turning to our catalyst, I think firstly, if there is information coming out of this parliamentary inquiry exactly how the operations work with franchisees, uh, more disclosure is going to hurt Harvey Norman, and also then it will become pretty evident that they can't sustain the store base. So this is a two-year price hog, so we believe in the next two years they would have to be consolidating their store base. The company seems to have a fair amount of real estate that it owns, yet it looks like relative to both EBITDA and the value based on the company of its real estate portfolio it has very little debt. Could you talk a little bit about the capital structure and why they've organized it the way that they have and what risks or opportunities that presents to your thesis? I think maybe first he's speaking to the debt. This is syndicated loans. They've got no public debt. Um, and it's also quite low. Um, from our understanding, uh, most of these, um, most of the capital structure is just um, financing this dividend through that little bit of uh, uh, syndicated loans. And then, yeah, that is pretty much then they have this asset base in the real estate that we think is kind of hard to impair. Do you have a sense of if they were able to mortgage up their properties that they own in order to continue to pay the dividend or buy back shares? So they've already provided secure. I mean, this debt is already secured against their properties. Um, you must understand that in Australia, um, businesses are tend to run with much more conservative balance sheets. And because they don't have a big high yield market like here in the US, it's harder to leverage up. So. Yeah, so we think that if you look at the comps, they, they generally have less than one turn of debt, and, and these guys have about one and a half turn right now. So we don't think that, they, that given the, the net, the, yeah, given how Australians operate their businesses, we don't think they'll lever up too much more. Um, I've definitely been pitched this by Australian short sellers as a scam. So you probably are onto something. Um, one thing that... <laughs> One, one, one area I'd love you to touch on is the, um, uh, the Amazon threat. Uh, so can you talk to the anti-competitive laws in Australia, which I believe are much stronger? There's a, <clears throat> supposedly a relationship between the manufacturers um, and JBH and uh, Harvey Norman, uh, so that uh, you know, it's going to be harder for Amazon to undercut on pricing. So perhaps you could talk, talk to that. I think I can't personally speak to the antitrust laws, maybe Greg can, but what we, will, what we can show here is that Amazon launched, it was a soft launch in December of 2017, and they came in at 13% above in, in pricing on electronics relative to their competitors. And in three short months, we can already see that they're now 2% below. So that's a 15% decrease in just three months. So if, if they've done that now, you know, we think they're just gonna continue to do that. And to Harvey Norman specifically, we can see the revenue mix of 80-20, and so they're especially vulnerable to this electronic uh, price deflation. Um, so we think the market has obviously assessed the threat of Amazon, but we think that they haven't quite grasped that Harvey Norman is probably more susceptible than its, than its peers. Yeah, to, to answer directly your question, I mean, I don't, I'm not aware of this antitrust law, so that's something I'm, I'm looking forward to, to investigating. Thank you. Um, You've identified on the map that the potential closures are all around, it looks like Perth and Brisbane. Is that because that's where you've seen the churn in the franchisees, or is that is that basically where they're geographically concentrated? Are they healthier? Do they also have exposure in Melbourne and Sydney, or and they're healthier there? And is there something going on with, I mean, everybody knows how the real estate's so hot and the economy's so hot in those two major cities, but are these, uh, secondary tertiary cities not doing as well, and also just in general, their market share in the area in the categories that they participate in. How big are they in terms of market share? Let me just speak to, to the locations. And you have to answer it in less than a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so quickly on the locations. Yes, you're right. That that um, through the data we've sourced, uh, proprietary data, we've uh, we found that yeah, it's concentrated in, in Brisbane and WA. As we know, these are mining-based economies. So, and they've been going for a tough time the last few years. Um, also, with the, threat, with the enter, entry of Amazon, obviously Amazon's going to target those urban areas first where it's more dense and they can, you know, they can bring prime to market more easily. So I think that's going to hit Harvey Norman really where it hurts the most, which is in the urban centers, because they're already doing poorly in those, in those more rural um, regional areas. 
and just maybe quickly speaking to the uh, market share, we see about a third in electronics market share for Harvey Norman, uh, slightly lower. It's about 5%. Uh, sorry, 10% in our furniture. Thanks very, very much. Thank you very much. My name is Mike Allison, and these are my teammates, Eric Hersfeld and Michael Wooten. Tonight, we're recommending Spotify as a short. Over the past few weeks, we have spoken to 23 music industry experts, including four music label CEOs, multiple experts on music royalties, former Spotify employees, artists, and others. It is from this diligence that we are confident in our 50% downside from Spotify's current market value today. Spotify has a current market cap of $26.5 billion, $1.8 billion in cash, no debt, and trades at a forward 4.1 times EV to, EV to sales multiple. Our thesis is simple. Spotify is a good product, but it's a bad business. The big three record labels, Universal, Sony, and Warner, dictate how profitable Spotify is allowed to be in this industry. Spotify's competitors are deep-pocketed tech players that don't care about making their platforms profitable to their, their music platforms profitable to their users. Thus, Spotify doesn't have pricing power. Finally, Spotify is negative business economics, meaning the more and more users listen to music, the higher and higher Spotify's costs become. It's for these reasons that we do not see Spotify having favorable negotiate, renegotiations with the big three music labels in 2019, causing them to miss 2020 consensus. Spotify operates in two segments. The first is the premium side. This is where users pay a fixed monthly rate and can pick and choose what to listen to as they want. This includes the 1926 song, Put Your Arms Where They Belong, written by Herman Ackman, Bill's grandfather. This is also, <laughs> they also have the ad base side. The ad base side is where users can listen to music for free, however, they're gonna be periodically interrupted by ads. Now let me tell you about the flow of money in this business. 90 cents comes in from premium, 10 cents comes in from advertising. Automatically, 52 cents gets stripped out to the big three music labels. Spotify also has to pay mechanical rates, and these mechanical rates are set by the copyright board, and Spotify won't tell you this, but they'll actually be increasing by 50% over the next five years, causing a roughly 4% headwind to the margins. Finally, through our primary research, we learned that the rest of cost of revenue is mostly variable, and this includes payments to artists, which are on a pay per stream basis. On your right, you'll be able to see who really has the power in this industry, both in terms of revenue and talent. So if we now look at the competitive landscape, pre-2016, Spotify was the only game in town, yet they still had to give up equity and agreed growth covenants in order to get better royalty rates from the big three music labels. Now that Apple is over 40 million user, paid users, Amazon has recently doubled its paid user base from 16 million to 32 million for its music platform, and the music labels are starting to sell their shares in Spotify. If you have all the power in this industry, and you have more competition heating up, what incentive do you really have to give Spotify better royalty rates? Now, I want everyone here to raise their hands if they use Amazon Prime. You guys have free access to music without commercials. That's the type of competition that Spotify is up against. Tech titans who don't care about the profit of their music business because they extract value from their customers in different ways. All of these competitors have already stated that they're gonna be entering into original video content, which will help them differentiate from Spotify in the future. Now, the industry itself is not well suited for Spotify. First, the music supply is essentially a commodity. Any song you hear on Spotify, you could also hear on any of their competing platforms. They don't have the ability to differentiate themselves in the same way that HBO did with Game of Thrones. Now, bulls out there will say that Spotify could become their own record label and sign their own artists. Every single industry expert that we spoke to said this is impossible due to the power of the back catalogs and who controls them. Now, for reference, 70% of all music listened to is back catalog content. And it makes sense. People like to listen to classic songs. But the problem for Spotify is that nearly all this content is controlled by the big three record labels, giving them power over Spotify if they were to ever try and sign their own artists. The day the record labels lose this power is the day that people stop listening to the Rolling Stones. Now finally, Spotify has some room to grow, but the competition has its hands all over the users that Spotify wants to gain, making growth much more difficult than expected. Spotify will say, but we have three key competitive advantages unique data, superior user experience, and playlists geared for music discovery. But I want to reiterate, in their 300-page prospectus, these are the only advantages that they claim to have. 
Now, every artist that we spoke to said that Facebook and Instagram provide them better data, it's free, and that they would never pay Spotify for it. The competition has integrated smart speakers, which will allow them to provide a more seamless music listening experience. And finally, Apple and Pandora have already caught up on AI curated playlists, and YouTube has already poached Spotify's top curator. At the end of the day, Spotify has zero sustainable competitive advantages in this marketplace. Now, moving to their business model, a lot of sell side analysts believe that Spotify is the next Netflix, but they have completely different business models. Netflix has high fixed costs for original content, but little to no marginal cost for each new user on their platform. Spotify, on the other hand, has to pay a percentage of revenue out to the record labels for every new user that it gets. It's cost scale with its growth. Now, though Spotify has increasing user engagement, even they know that for each, or even they know that as more people listen to uh, content on their platform, uh, they have to pay out more variable costs to artists on a pay per stream basis. Now, a lot of people think that Spotify has the best music product out there today. But if you look at their retention rate and compare it of those with the other subscription-based services and comps, they're dead last at 49%, meaning 51% of their paying users left Spotify in 2017. In addition, they have, uh, they have uh, decreasing ARPU uh, over the past two years, and that trend is expected to continue over the next year based on their guidance. Spotify is facing an uphill battle against increasing competition and against a monopoly that controls their supply. The record labels have all the power in this industry. We know it. Spotify knows it. And in 2019, the market's going to know it when Spotify goes to renegotiate the royalty rates with the big three record labels. Royalty agreements in this industry are typically two-year contracts. And Spotify was able to renegotiate these in 2017 pre-IPO. And during those negotiations, Spotify actually did increase their gross margins but it came with hefty concessions, including giving up 16% of their equity. Based on our extensive primary research, Spotify is not going, to be, uh, not going to have favorable negotiations in 2019. Spotify needs to reduce their royalty rate by 8% in the next round of negotiations in order to match consensus estimates for gr their gross margin. To put that in perspective, that's 33% better than they did last go around when they had more bargaining chips and were the only streamer in the market. Now they have extensive competition, and we spoke to a CEO of one of the big three record labels, and this is what he had to say on the matter. They do not have the back catalogs that we have, and he needs those to be successful today. He's committed to using tech to try and beat us. I am determined not to be beaten by him. We will pull all of our levers to control Spotify's behavior. Now, does that sound like the kind of person that you want to negotiate with when your gross margins are on the line? Content is still king, and this chart depicts that. And it's going to be a headwind for Spotify on a go forward basis. And due to the increased competition in the industry, they're not going to be able to lower their other operating expenses and make up for the fact. So they're not going to reach profitability in 2019 or 2020 like the market thinks. And they're not going to be able to reach uh, any kind of meaningful operating profitability by 2027. And we've built this into our evaluation models, where we give them sol solid top line growth and user growth. But because there's no operating leverage in this business, they will never reach significant economic profitability, and their stock price is overvalued and will be cut in half. Now, obviously, there are risks to our thesis, but Eric noted why original content isn't in the cards in the near term. And I just talked about why margin expansion and excessive growth is going to be very difficult in the competitive market. The one risk we haven't talked about is takeout risk. And we acknowledge that takeout risk is a, uh, it's a serious risk for any short thesis, and this is certainly no exception. But we don't think takeout risk is going to be an imminent threat, especially since they just IPO'd and due to the co uh, competitive dynamics in the industry. We would also note as a case study, Pandora fell 90% and still hasn't been taken out yet. Now, why do you think that is? Could it be because a good product doesn't make a great business? Now we'll open up for questions. Sorry, I have two questions. Um, firstly, um, on your valuation, you talk about the percentage of TAM going up. Yes. So can you expand on that? Because it seems to be a bit counter to what you're talking about in terms of market share. And um, secondly, are we shorting this into the end of the lockup period, which uh, you didn't, I don't think you highlighted. Thanks. You can have sure. that. You talk about valuation. Yeah, so uh, as far as valuation goes, so from a TAM perspective, the overall pie is growing. For the TAM, so we're giving, the, we're, we're not 
uh, underestimating how big that's going. So we think that uh, right now it's 1.3 billion uh, cell, phones, uh, cell phone users that have payment on their cell phones. And we see that over the next 10 years expanding to 2.2 billion. Um, so we're, TAM's pretty large. And, but we have them with roughly 35% market share uh, by 2027. So what we're saying is it's not going to be a winner-take-all market, and they're going to be sharing that pie with uh, whether it's Apple or Amazon, but they'll be sharing it with somebody else. And then as far as the lockup, as far as the lockup goes, with the way they list it as a direct listing, there actually is no direct lockup. So the insiders could sell as soon as they went public. Oh, um, you guys have that slide with the ARPU declining, but. Um, They've added a family plan, which is something that Netflix is trying to do. And I'm, I'm curious what, if you were to look at that on a total, on a household basis, how would that look? Because it, it could be actually trending the other way, where they're actually monetizing more of the household. Yeah, so they, uh, they originally claimed that this is because of the family plan. That's kind of the only reason they state. What we saw is it's really mainly more from them moving into new geographic regions. Um, yeah, if I can go to the last slide and show you. Um, so yes, obviously the plan, family plan is something that caused a little bit of uh, ARPU decline, but ooh. it's actually not positive. It's just that it's your measurement versus. Right? Sorry, can you say it one more time? Oh, they're, they're actually getting paid for what had been a previous free member. So oh, for the family plan. Increase. Well, yeah, but then they're double. I mean, they're double counting in a way because they're essentially counting that entire family now as a paying user when there's only getting now $14.99. They used to, from, from one user, they used to charge $30.99 and then Apple came in and had a $14.99 plan and they had to match on that. Um, but so what we realized is that most of this is coming from, as you can see, for Netflix pricing really doesn't change um, in different regions, but for Spotify it drastically changes based on the GDP of the region that they're entering. Um, so a lot of the regions they're in, um, originally went to were high price in the beginning, but now as they expand, especially as they talk about expanding into Africa, it's going to continue based on the price points that they're allowed to hit. That's based on um, uh, piracy, really, right? Because you really can't charge high rates for it, markets that have high piracy. It's somewhat based on piracy. It's mainly based on what the region can actually take. So uh, Denmark, I believe, is their most uh, expensive user at $18. but. As they're migrating into like South America, you can see they only hit a four dollar price point, mainly because of what like actual households can afford to pay. Uh, they had a public or like roadshow, right, that everyone could listen to, et cetera. At the investor day call. Right. Yeah. I mean, did they say anything about the royalty negotiations? It must have been a hot point of contention with investors. They said nothing. No. So they didn't mention it pretty much at all because the investor day call was essentially just them touting what they think the future of Spotify is. There were no. The Q and A was mostly cut out from the the online video that was provided. Um, so royalty rates weren't really touched on. Okay. But they, their, their big claim is that they think that they can grow to large enough um, and quick enough that they can have power over the record labels by controlling demand. And just one follow-up question. How do you think about a ceiling on valuation here? Because it, it's difficult with these big tech names. You get a lot of enthusiasm. You get growth in subscribers, et cetera. I mean, you've seen this at Fang stocks, et cetera. I mean, how do you think yeah. about that? I'll let Michael take that. Yeah, so we did a lot of sensitivity analysis with this because um, obviously when you have a high growth name and uh, when most of the valuation is in the terminal value, um, things can go very differently. And basically, we looked at it as if we gave them the gross margin and gave them extremely high growth rates of for 10 years of 20 plus percent CAGR, what has to happen with the other operating margins in order to justify the current share price today? And so I gave them uh, 22 percent top line kegger and I gave them 30 to 34 uh, 4 percent gross margins and it still only came out to be a 30 35 dollars stock versus the 54 dollars that was trading at today one of the things that's interesting I think about Spotify's business model that I don't think you touched on directly is that it's actually uh, producing a lot more free cash flow than what you would expect right. uh, it's a cash flow positive business and I think a lot of that relates to a d deferred revenue component paying up front, but at the same time, you don't pay your artists, I believe, until something like the end of the year, even though you're accruing those liabilities. As the, the business grows through the expanding market and then either holding or increasing share, I would assume that number would get bigger over time. So could you talk about a business that's growing over time where free cash flow is significantly in excess of earnings and how that would impact your thinking on valuation? Right. It hasn't been a uh, significant free cash flow. It has free cash flow positive this last year. And as you said, it is a subscription model, so they do get cash on the front end. 
and then they pay it out on a quarterly basis as they accrue liabilities and pay them off to the artist. Um, what the, and so as you say, as they grow quickly, yes, they have negative networking capital. What happens though in our model is we're, we're giving them a very low uh, change in sales to capital ratio, uh, which typically in the industries it's uh, usually between two and four times. And we're, we have it starting off at seven times in our model and the valuation, which is extremely low. And then we have that uh, falling to only five times over the course of it, which is still extremely low, though we think it's gonna be more capital intensive as they go down the road and they have to put more money into expanding their team. So they need more, uh, more PP&E for the work and all that. So the fixed capital component over time will outweigh the current liabilities in the model. And the way we think about it is, Using the current balance sheet of a company that's growing this rapidly and changing this quickly, it's kind of like taking the report card when you're in kindergarten and projecting whether or not you're going to be getting to Harvard. And that's probably not the best way to think about this company uh, on a go-forward basis. Yes. Um. This is an interesting, I feel I have to challenge you on the answer that you gave me before, because if I look at your bear case scenario, mm -hmm. um, where you have the TAM going up from 12 to 32%, uh, you also have the premium ARPU going up to 570. Um, it sort of seems a little counterintuitive. Can you talk to um, what the scenario, what the downside would be if you kept you know, the TAM more or less the same? Um, yeah. So the TAM, the overall size is the same. And, and what we basically kept the premium ARPU and the ad base ARPU very similar in that, in the, between the different models. The real difference between these models is in the margin projections, especially the, where the margins are in the terminal value. And, and especially since that's where the bulk of the valuation is, given the fact that the company, we don't have them being, um, reaching any kind of economic profitability for the next seven to eight years. But if you assume going out sort of 2000, 27, you know, that your, <clears throat> your TAM, percentage of TAM sort of is smaller, then what, what is the downside? Because it's, it's tough to, to short, you know, a company that's sort of compounding at 16%, quite frankly, you know, generating this kind of cash flow. So I just really want to understand right. what the real downside, it seems like you're just being too generous, frankly, on the bear case. <laughs> yeah. So the way I look at this slide is you kind of have two components of the, the TAM, and it's the pricing power, and then you have the churn. And my favorite thing is to look at sell-side models where they have churn going down and the ARPU going up at the same time. It's like, that's a really good business. Show me that business. Um, so we think that as they increase the ARPU, they're naturally going to have more churn at the lower end. So, but the quality of the, the players that stay, uh, the customers that stay on the platform are better, and therefore the margins are expanded. Any more questions from the panel? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, I'm Asher with my teammates Rana and Jade, and we're short Star Cycle with a $38 price target presenting 36% downside over the next 18 months. Our thesis is threefold. One, we believe that the fallout following the recent class action lawsuit over Star Cycle's pricing tactics is still in the early innings and will continue to drive revenue and margin declines. Two, four turns of leverage and short-term cash requirements will prevent Star Cycle from continuing its roll-up strategy. And three, we believe that multiple red flags highlight Star Cycle's declining fundamentals. And Rana will discuss what Star Cycle does and the headwinds the company's facing. Thanks, Asher. Hi, everyone. So let's move on to how Star Cycle makes money. So Study Cycle 2 main businesses are regular medical waste and document shredding. And in regular medical waste, their key customers are small quantity SQ customers, such as doctors, physicians, dentists. And these customers account for 42% of EBITDA. So if you all are doctors and you are Study Cycle customers, you would get a red box like this, where you can dump your pharmaceutical waste or sharps, and the company would send its truck to collect this box, let's say once every month, and you would be charged X amount of dollar for that service. So this is their business in nutshell. Moving on, this is our earnings decline path. As you can see, we are projecting a decline in revenue and EBITDA, and the key driver for that decline is deteriorating SQ business. Our third chart shows that our EBITDA 
numbers are below consensus, which is mainly driven by the by the fact that we are projecting a sharper decline in revenue in the SQ business and contraction in margin because the company has decent fixed cost and most of the growth is coming from low margin business. So this leads to the question you would probably have in your mind that why our team is so pessimistic about SQ business. So in this slide, which shows how company's future is going to look different from the past. So thanks to consolidation in the past, the company has become a leading player in the SQ business. They have grown through consolidation, they've raised prices up to 18% annually, and they charge at least 30% above premium as compared to competitors. And also, they used to lock down their customers for five years. However, in the future, they are capping their price increase at 5%. They are price matching to the competition. The contract length is somewhere between one to three years. And the balance sheet is too stretched to make any acquisition in the future. So this leads to the question, why Stericycle is suddenly dropping prices? So last year, oh sorry, last year in October, there was a settlement of $300 million, uh, lawsuit settlement of $300 million, which brought Stericycle's price, price gouging mechanism to the forefront. And our primary research shows that since then, Stericycle has staffed its retention department <laughs> at record level. In fact, we have spoken with private players in this market, five different private players in this market, and all of them, all of them have said that that competition is spending heavily in the marketing to win Stericycle disgruntled customers. So our key takeaway from this slide is that the impact from this lawsuit is not just $300 million, but there is a long-term headwind in terms of pricing pressure they're gonna, they're gonna face, which is underappreciated by the market. Moving on, we did a price comparison between Stericycle service versus competition in four different cities, and we took a price quote from 16 different players. What we found, as you can see in the highlighted red box, that Stericycle still charges a premium over competition. But what I want to highlight is that when we spoke with sales representatives of Stericycle, they all said that since January 1, 2018, they've had a massive shift in business philosophy and they are all are focusing on keeping their customers happy and maintaining the retention rate. So even with that shift, this is the difference in the price. So you can, you can imagine how much runway there is for price drop on the older contracts. With that, I would pass to Jade. Thanks, Rana. So we expect SQ revenue to decline by 7%, which is primarily driven by its inability to raise pricing going forward. And this is in sharp contrast to the 10% of price increase they've had in the past. On the volume side, we expect volume to decline by 7% as well, which is actually less severe than before, as the company is aggressively making price concession to retain and gain new customers. However, due to the high fiscal cost structure this business has, we expect the 7% decline in revenue will translate into 14% decline in EBITDA. So the healthcare industry has been going through consolidation, which has shown the customer base for SQ, which is the most profitable business for Stereocycle. As you can see in this chart, the percentage of physicians that are employees of large hospital groups have increased from 42% to 47% in the past five years. And for every dollar that is shifting from SQ to LQ, there's a decremental margin of 20%. This is an important reason why the margin profile for this business has been declining. Our second thesis is that the value disruptive M&A has led to lower margins, ROICs, and have left this business with a string balance sheet. Take the 2.1 billion shredded acquisition, for example. This is a cyclical business in a secularly declining industry. There's limited economy of scale between the core medical waste business and the paper shredding business. We also expe expect the recycling paper margin to come down as recycled paper pricing comes off its cyclical peak. So what's going on here is that there's a mixed shift to lower margin in RIC businesses. A bit more background on this company. So this is a business that has been built on acquisitions and this is how it has gained its market share in premium pricing, especially in the SQ segment. However, going forward, we think it's going to be extremely difficult for them to continue this roll-up strategy. Its net leverage is at full time right now. They have 750 million obligations due for the next two years. And they, their credit rating and outlook was recently downgraded, which speaks to the kind of balance stress they're going through. 
And they have 1.2 billion debt due in 2020, which is currently paying 2 to 3% interest. And we expect that to go up when they have to refinance that, that debt at that point. Lastly, they were close to trip the covenant until they got a relief from the lenders through the end of 2019. Thanks, Jade. <clears throat> Our third thesis is that there are numerous red flags that highlight Stericycle's deteriorating fundamentals. What we wanted to point out is the fact that allowance for doubtful accounts has tripled over the past two years and is more than three times that of competitors. The useful life of customer relationship has, ha has halved over the past four years, which is quite alarming considering the fact that over its 500 acquisitions, Stericycle has been paying a premium simply for these customer relationships. But what's most disturbing to us is the growing delta between gap and adjusted EPS as management continues increasing the addbacks to earnings. That is going on as free cash flow conversion of adjusted EPS is declining. The one thing bulls and bears do agree on is Saracycle's management. Over the past four years, more than $5 billion of market value has been destroyed despite the company having made more than $3 billion of acquisitions. We believe the management is focused on empire building while destroying value at the expense of shareholders. But what's most striking here, as you can see in the bottom right chart, is the fact that despite their long tenure with the company, management has practically no ownership of stock. So how do we see this playing out over the next 18 months? We expect continued earnings misses going, going through 2019 and expect a large asset impairment, considering the fact that 70% of the company's assets are intangibles. We also wouldn't be surprised by further earnings restatements and even an SEC investigation into the, company accounting, into the company's accounting policies. In terms of key risks, there's a possibility that an activist investor might get involved and try to shape up management or break up the company. But Jana Partners did try doing that in 2016 and quickly exited the position. And we spoke to an analyst who worked on that deal. And, I, and we feel that at current valuations and with the headwinds that Starcycle is facing, it is not a compelling activist play. The second key risk is waste management or a competitor acquiring Starcycle to enter the medical waste industry. So we spoke to industry executives and former waste management employees. And we believe that with the current valuation still being high and with the headwind star cycles facing, it would be too risky and too expensive of an acquisition. Our base case assumes a nine and a half times forward EBITDA multiple on 2020 EBITDA, bringing us to a price of slightly below $38, presenting 36% downside from current prices. What we find compelling here is that even if we're wrong, and that management hits the high end of guidance 2018, revenue grows going forward and margins stabilize, and using an industry high multiple of 11 times, we still only arrive at a price target of $68, which is only 17% upside from current prices. So we believe we have an attractive risk reward profile of nearly four to one. So to wrap it up, while bulls believe that Star Cycle is a good value play with pricing headwinds in, in the late innings, we believe with high, operate, with high operating high fixed costs, high financial leverage, weak management, Saracycle is a great short. And with that, we'll be happy to take your questions. So you talk about the uh, business effectively being a you know, large fixed cost base. What, why do you, how confident are you that they can't take costs out of the system here? Um, so we look into the cost structure. So basically, 50% of cost is fixed and 50% is variable. We do think they have some advantage in their fixed cost, but in the variable portion, as you know, they, their pricing um, is much higher than its competitor. So from our research, we believe that they do need to keep a large uh, marketing department to um, keep their pricing at um, a premium compared to competitors. That's why their margin has come down in the past, but we think that it's going to, well, it's going to go down further in the future, but will um, stay at a certain level. What's the nature of the, of the competition? Uh, how many of their competitors are public? How many of them are private? How well managed are they? What kind of resources do they have? And do they have different business practices? Sure, so the only public player is Sharp's compliance, and a lot of people compare Sharp's compliance with Stericycle. It's not a fair comparison between, because A, it's a very small player, and B, only 17% of Sharp's compliance revenue comes from the route density business. The rest of the business, it's actually mail back system. So you get a mail back, and you, uh, you dump your medical waste, and then you mail back to the facility. So other than that, there are private players, and we've spoken with Daniel, Scottish Bay, and so they are mainly private players in the industry. So 
as I said in the slide, that uh, the company has 70% market share as of now, so it's fragmented industry. So that answers your first part. Yeah, just to follow up in terms of on the management, the thing I find remarkable here, you have a company that's lost a huge percentage of its market value, pricing issues, accounting issues, and the management tenure looks you know, very long and you know, tiny equity ownership. Why, haven't, uh, why hasn't the board fired this management team? And what is the risk uh, that the, you know, the board gets wis you know, wise, fires the management team, and brings in a phenomenal uh, CEO? How do you think about that risk? So one thing to point out um, is that management's tenure, that's with the company overall. They joined the company. The CEO joined the company in 1997. He's only been CEO for the past five years, and now he's trying to lead the company through a business transformation. Um, in terms of the risk, uh, man, the board seems to be um, more of a country club base. Uh, for our four former executives from Abbott, um, which rent a third or more of composition of the board. So we also, we also see that from Jana Partners entry as an activist play, that they, they thought there might be potential to, throw, to overthrow management and to, drop, and to drop the cost. But it seems that there's a lot of, just after 500 acquisitions, there's a lot of fat and a lot of integration that still has a long way to go. So. And also, just a quick comment on the quality of the business. While study cycle, just waste management is a good business, it's a relevant business, there is not enough product differentiation, and we think study cycle is charging much higher than what, on a normalized basis, you can charge for this business, given there has not been any product differentiation. So when we spoke with competitors, they highlighted that you can make money in this business and be profitable and have sustainable ROIC, even when you charge half of what Stericycle is making. What I'm puzzled by in your pricing survey, how is it possible they're still charging 100%, 85% above competitors if they don't have a differentiated service offering? And you know when a contract comes up for renewal in light of the reputational issues, Sure, so, so two things. First, uh, like earlier, because the contract length used to be five years, so the doctors were, they were kind of binded by the contract. But aren't these prices the prices for a new customer, not the prices for the average customer? Yeah, yeah. So, and also when the contracts are coming off the renewal, those customers are also like, so that is, that is the reason why competition is spending heavily in marketing, because they have a chance to get new customers as well as those customers who are coming off the contract. So earlier, because one, like because the contract length was five years, they were coming off the contract. Now they have an opportunity to get those customers. Just, just to piggyback off Rana, um, we, so the, the company believes that it has brand recognition and that the first name you think of when you go for medical waste management is Stericycle. So they think they're the first quote and that doctors will go with them. So that's why we believe they're, they're still priced at a premium. company like this that is just materially larger than its competitors, um, it's got a lot of leverage to be able to um, just continue its market dominance. You know, between acquiring, you know, competitors that are doing particularly well, um, just using sort of its, its stock as currency, levering up uh, with, with its debt capacity, um, and just leveraging its economies of scale and distribution network. Um, uh, why, you know, in the face of that, do you think that competitive threats from smaller players, even though they're pricing lower, um, you know, are definitely going to be able to, to eat into that market dominance? Sure. So, uh, yeah, as you can see, so when we talked to these competitors, we asked uh, the competitor which is charging the lowest amount of money in each area. And while economies of scale is important, it is very much local economies of scale. So in, for example, if you're a dominant player, if you're Curtis Bay and you're a dominant player in DC area, all you need to do is to have a very um, you know, dense route density in DC in order to charge lower prices. And also what they do, they collect waste management, like waste, and then they send it to processing facility. So if your processing facility is very close to that route density, then you can charge much lower premium. So, so for example, if, uh, you know, a lead player in t Texas, it would be dif difficult for Texas bio waste to charge similar price in DC and vice versa. So yes, to your point, economies of scale matters, but it's very localized and that's why c competitors are able to just- And just in terms of that network density that you, that you spoke about, um, I would assume the stereocycle in, you know, most major cities uh, has that density as a significant density over its, over its competitors, right? Right, yes. Um. What 
Um, I wanted to follow up on the SEC comment. Um, so it's pretty clear from the SEC filings that there is a formal investigation going on. So subpoenas have been issued. Uh, there's also a criminal exposure here because of uh, the, the Justice Department's involved. So um, I'd be curious to think kind of what the next stage is on that. Do you think that will lead to a restatement? Um, and then secondly, if you were CEO, what would you do to get the stock up? <laughs> so. We'll start with the first question. CEO has, has been discussing the business transformation uh, in which they're putting around $300 million more into the business, tried transforming with a new ERP system. And they, they believe that, that going forward, more back-ended closer to 2020, 2022 will help uh, drive margin and revenue growth. In terms of the investigation, we're not familiar with a, with a formal SEC investigation or Justice Department, but there have been, there's been numerous uh, correspondence between the SEC and the company. So we spoke to, we spoke to a well-regarded forensic accountant who has looked into the company and, and their tactics and what they've done. And, he, and he's researched it for his clients. He told us that based on the correspondence and the persistence of the SEC, he would not be surprised if an investigation were to continue. It would, would, to, would start. The second part of my question was, if you were CEO, what would you do to fix it? It's tough. <laughs> You bought, after final year acquisitions, how do you start unrolling? There, there's been discussions that people are saying maybe divest shred it. But if you divest shred it, that's going to get a lower multiple in the market. And then they would hope for a higher multiple and a higher valuation on the core medical waste business. But that itself is facing headwinds. So it's very tough. They, they, their game would probably have to be to lower prices to match competitors. But that would, that would really expose their fat and, 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 their, and bring down their margins even further. I was just wondering um, on renewal if there's any if there are any churn statistics or if you have any sense on that and also how ironclad are the contracts because um, with this kind of pricing differential are the, are the doctors just kind of stuck and then one other question for the typical small client how material is this in terms of an office expense because one trend you are seeing is a lot of roll ups and even like small market PE is getting very involved in this space and looking at costs when they come in and they buy these things. But if, if, if it's a four or five year contract, like, and if it's a very small cost in the office, like, is there flexibility to, to really push these guys out any, any faster on a change of control? And also, how material is it as an office expense? On the volume term, so historically the net volume loss has been around 10 to negative 10 to 15 percent. They don't disclose that number, so we kind of back it out from the pricing increase um, information we obtained from talking to different people. So on the contract, right? So I think one of the reasons they were able to um, charge such a large pricing and have those customers in the past is that their contract were really hard to get out. And what happened now is that a lot of its competitors actually um, are trying to educate steel cycle customers to get out of their contract. Uh, so we're actually out of time, but that was, thank you very much. So, yeah, yeah. So there's going to be a reception upstairs where the judges get together to discuss the presentations. I will say that uh, in doing this for 11 years, we will have the most difficult time, I think, differentiating among the presentations. I thought they were really all excellent. Um, so there's definitely not one winner here. Maybe there are five, uh, <laughs> and then we have to differentiate among them. But uh, no, we're going to pick. We're going to pick winners. Uh, audience, uh, thank you very much for attending. Go have some food. We'll starve while we choose. Uh, <laughs> all right, thank you.